good morning. Here we are. It's the physics video lecture. Physics 2A video lecture 18. And we're in a great chapter right now on linear momentum. So I'll do a bit of a review of what we looked at last time and then we'll continue on. So momentum and collisions, this would be chapter six, momentum and collisions. And now that we've seen the material, now that we've seen the material, we can kind of review really quickly what we have gone over. So numbering things, we have the concept of linear momentum. And the letter P is used note the mass times the velocity and I have made the point that this is the dynamical quantity whereas the velocity itself is just the kinematic quantity right now it has some mass behind it and the units are just kilograms times meters per second so there's nothing special going on right there Then we had the concept of impulse. So the impulse, I'll use the letter I. It's a vector though. It's a force times time. So newtons times seconds. But what we discovered was that the impulse, so if you apply a force on something for a certain amount of time, typically a short time, oh yeah, good, typically a short time, that turns out to be the change of momentum. M delta V is what we had the other, uh, the other day, okay, M times delta V. So impulse equals the change of momentum. And this already has some interesting illustrations because if you're just thinking about F times delta T here, so we're just focusing on this, then you could have a large force in a short time or a small force in a longer time and that product would be the same, it would be a change of momentum. So under some circumstances, you want to cushion a blow, so to speak. You want to cushion something, and you want the delta T to be large, and then the force will be small. The momentum we're talking about on this side of the equation, that could be something moving in here. Okay? It's moving in with mass times velocity, and you want to bring it to a stop. So you can bring it to a stop with a sharp blow, which is going to be an enormous force, or you can bring it to a stop over a greater amount of time, cushion it, and then you've got a longer time and a smaller force. So there's some practical application right there. Good, so we've got momentum and we've got the impulse, and now we're going to talk about the collisions, which is basically what we ended up with last time. So for the collision idea, and I had given a few demonstrations of collisions. You know, I'll just draw it, for example, some rolling cars that are about to do a head-on collision of some type or another. And what we, end, uh, what we talked about last time was that the external force is zero. The net external force is zero. For example, these cars on the track, we say the net external force is zero because it's just the normal force and the weight, okay? So the net external force is zero and the internal force is the force that they're exerting on each other. And then so then I could say from F12 is equal to minus F21. So just from Newton's third law, we ended up with the following M1 V1 plus M2 V2, and those are the other vectors, equals M1 V1 prime 
of m2 v2 prime. So I use this formalism with the prime vector to mean after the collision, okay, after, and the unprimed is before, and what we have is the total linear momentum is conserved. And so this important note that I just stated, the net external force is equal to zero. So I'll just write this here with, um, yeah, net external force vanishes. That's the way we often express ourselves here. We say something equals zero, we say it vanishes. Okay, no net external force, and then we have this law here. We're going to get a lot of practice applying this. This is a many applications here. I'm going to start with a really simple one that I didn't have last time. So these collision cars this time, they're not going to be magnetic or anything. We already talked about that. But this one has a little foot in it that'll kick. Okay. So I'm going to let the blue car kick, I'm going to call this the red car. Okay, the blue car is going to kick the red car, and they're both moving without friction. Let's see what happens here. Um, let me get it that way. There we go. Okay. Blue is going to kick red. So I the trigger there, and they both went rolling. Now, suppose I take some extra mass off the blue car. Now the blue car is going to be much less massive than it just was. And once again, I'm going to set that foot off. Now you had a nice effect. You saw this one zooms out. This one went much slower. I'm going to add some mass to the already more massive one and repeat this exercise and you'll see now this one really shot out this one barely moved so you're looking at recoil you're looking at recoil the blue one this time was the bullet and this one was the gun just as an example okay so we, let's analyze this in terms of momentum right now. So this is our first example, demonstration and example. Recoil cars, we'll call them that. You guys draw your little picture of what we just saw. So what is the linear momentum right now at this moment? Okay, you look there, calculate it, and you realize they're not moving at all, so it's zero. So we're going to take this equation here, and we'll have zero initial momentum, and then we have after the, um, yeah, after the interaction. By the way, this is the internal force because it just coming out of this car right here. Okay, this is a perfect example of an internal force. Yeah, so zero equals M1 V1 prime plus M2 V2 prime. Okay, you definitely saw them moving after the collision. And what this means is, I'm gonna go ahead and keep the vector here. In one dimension, I don't really need the vector. What this means is they're going in opposite directions going in opposite directions so that their momenta add up to zero. You can also see if they had equal masses, they would have equal speeds. But if one of them has a much larger mass, then it has to have a smaller speed. Okay. So even this really simple ex example has all manner of good applications. And uh, if, you know, if this were a rifle and this thing were the bullet, then you could even calculate what the recoil velocity of the rifle would be. 
based on the bullet coming out. Okay, so this, this is true for very great mass disparities. There they look pretty equal, but a bullet versus a rifle is very small. So yeah, let's call this recoil and, and uh, take good note of it. Now the next application, I'm going to refer to a demonstration we had last time. And that was when the cars collide and stick together. I showed it to you on the air track over there, and I showed it to you on this track right here. Um, so the kind of collision where objects collide and stick together is very important. It's called the inelastic collision. In fact, it's called the perfectly inelastic collision. So here's what I'll do, I'll write perfectly inelastic collision. I'll put the perfectly in parentheses because I don't always want to say it. We will refer to the inelastic collision in this way. So the perfectly inelastic collision, two objects collide and stick together. So objects collide and stick together. Objects collide. Uh, this is one that's easy to deal with. So what we're going to do is take our equation up there. It's still a vector equation. I'm showing you demonstrations in one dimension, and uh, we're going to do applications in one dimension, but as long as we can use the vector equation, we will. So objects collide and stick together. Um, let's do this. M1, V1 plus m2 v2 yeah what do we get on the right side if they collide and stick together they now are a single mass of mass m1 plus m2 because they're stuck together and therefore they have a common final velocity that we'll just call v prime and we can solve for v prime just by dividing the left side by m1, both sides by m1 plus m2. So we can solve for v prime, I'm not going to, but uh, that's one vector equation. So that is actually three equations in space and two equations in the plane or one equation on the line. m1, v1, m2, v2, m1 plus m2, v prime. So we'll come back to this as a vector equation. But the next thing we want to do is consider a one-dimensional, so one-dimensional, it's like on a straight track, collision. So consider collision in one dimension. So we're along a track, and what we're going to do is have one uh, object at rest and the other one's going to come in and hit it. That's the way I uh, demonstrated it the other day. So we'll draw our picture. We've got the car here. That's M1. Right, it's moving. So we have M1, V1 here. Now M2, we're going to have V2 equals zero. So M1 comes in, collides with M2, they stick together and continue on their way. Um, so this would be A or before and after the collision, I draw them as being stuck together. M1 and M2, and now they have a speed V prime. That seems simple enough, and it is. Collision 1D. So yeah, we should put some words there. So this here is before the collision.
this is after the collision. Um, and here, this car is initially at rest. We're going to set up a few like that so it's worth it to specify. Good. Yeah, so the calculation is easy. You guys are probably doing it while I'm erasing this board. Okay. If you're not, you could be. So we're just going to set up our equation now. We have M1, V1. The V2 is 0, so that's equal to M1 plus M2. They're moving together. B prime, and I, this time I'm going to solve for B prime. M1 divided by M1 plus M2 times B1. Okay, very easy to obtain, and interesting result. You'll notice if the two masses are equal, which is what I demonstrated the other day. The two masses are equal, then you have one half. And then the final speed is one half of the initial because the masses are equal. Perfect example of momentum being conserved. Any other thing, you're not just going to see it right away. Then you have to calculate and take this ratio here. Okay, so that is basic enough. But the next um, question is one that we generally can't guess. It's kind of an interesting thing. The question namely is, we have this collision that could be two pieces of clay sticking together. You could have sticky tape, get out a, a needle into some clay. We have a lot of different ways to make things stick together. These cars have Velcro on them, you know, so they can stick together that way. That's what I demonstrated last time. And the collision can be very gentle. And the thing is this. We know that momentum is conserved, but what about kinetic energy? So in these collisions, momentum is conserved. In the collision, momentum, linear momentum, is conserved. That's what we're doing. That's what our equal sign means up here, right? Before and after, momentum is conserved. What about kinetic energy? Question mark. Okay, the way to figure that, um, see what's going on with the kinetic energy is to calculate it. So I'm discussing this scenario here, the collision in 1D, the one we just calculated everything here for. So kinetic energy before the collision. That's just kinetic energy equals one half m1 v1 squared. Because that's the only thing that's moving. Kinetic energy after the collision I forget if we're using just k or ke. Just for brevity, I'll use capital K. Kinetic energy. So that was before the collision. After the collision, we're going to call it K prime, okay? In honor of the prime side. And that would be the following. One half total mass times the new speed squared. You'll see I'm just putting, I'm just applying the definition. But what happens here, what happens next, is interesting. Continue on with the equal sign, and we're going to put the V prime in. We've got a half, M1 plus M2. Now, the V prime we calculated here, we put a big square bracket. We have M1 divided by M1 plus M2, V1, the quantity squared. OK, I've plugged this whole thing in here, and I'm now going to factor out what can be factored out. So you guys make sure you see how this works. 
one of the, by the way, one of the homework assignments is going to be exactly what I'm doing here. So you're warned. So one half, I've got an M1 right here, okay? I'm going to take that M1. I've got a V1 squared here because it's squared. Now what I have left over, because you see I, I just took M1 and V1 squared, I have the other M1, and here I have M1 plus M2 divided by M1 plus M2, the quantity squared. So I have M1 plus M2. Okay, this expression here is actually quite surprising. It's what we weren't expecting this, because this is the initial kinetic energy, right? This is the same as this. So what we've discovered is false. I put a box around this. We found that K prime is equal to M1 divided by M1 plus M2 times the initial kinetic energy. So put that in words. This is a very important result here. so important about this? Well, the final kinetic energy, for example, suppose these cars have equal mass. Okay, these cars, these actually don't, but I demonstrated it last time. Suppose they have equal mass, collide and stick together with the Velcro and keep moving. In that case, equal masses means we've got a factor of one over two. In that case, the final kinetic energy is only one half of the initial, and the question is, where did it go? So, really important note right here. Right? These could have been two lumps of clay that stuck together. You didn't even hear them collide. Okay? You didn't even hear them collide. If they're equal masses, then the final kinetic energy is one half of the initial kinetic energy. M1 equals M2, then K prime is only one half K. And I'll put some exclamation points at there. Where did the energy go? We talked about conservation of energy. We kind of expected it to come up here. It did not happen here. So in fact, um, how do we put this? At this stage of mechanics, we can't even know where it went. It's a mystery, a complete mystery, because we've done everything fair and square. The answer is that these masses, which we've just labeled one and two, are made out of molecules. They're made out of atoms. And this collision here, this collision, has set the molecules in motion. There's internal motion that happens. It's not part of our discussion yet, but I can't hide it from you. There's internal motion, and that kinetic energy that seems as though we were seeing is now part of the internal motion of the molecules vibrating. Okay. Vibrating, and therefore you could say turned into heat. And in fact, what you can all try is if you pound on a nail with a hammer and then feel the nail, you'll notice it gets warmer just from pounding on it. Okay, so collisions actually convert energy into heat. And, uh, but yeah, this is a really important point. So I'm gonna make another added note of that. The significance of this perfectly inelastic collision is that the kin kinetic energy is not conserved. Not conserved. And if you do calculations and somehow think you're going to use energy conservation, you're going to make a big mistake. So yeah, I always introduce the subject this way because it's such an important point, and we'll write that down in words as well. So in an inelastic collision, energy is not conserved. So 
there's some great applications that follow from that. Um, so the lost energy, and of course, energy isn't really lost. So the lost energy is converted to what we call internal energy. And that can take various forms, but we'll just say it's heat. Internal energy, which like I said, our discussion knows nothing about. We just thought these things are masses M1 and that's it. So convert to internal energy, for example, heat. doing your time lapse. Excellent. We've got nothing but time. So now that we know this, we can do some interesting applications. And the one I want to talk about next is the ballistic pendulum. So next, how to measure the speed of a bullet. If you want to know how fast a bullet's going and you just realize you can't pull out a stopwatch and somehow time it fists over time. That's not going to work. Speed of a bullet. And I mean a bullet that's been fired out of a gun, not just one that's resting on the table. So the speed of a bullet is measured with something called the ballistic pendulum. And in the homework, I'm going to do two variations of this that you'll recognize, even though they won't look like the ballistic pendulum. So what we want to do is shoot a bullet. So M times B, things racing along. We want to shoot it into a block of wood. And the block of wood is going to be set up like a pendulum. And so it's going to be carried up in an arc. Right? It's going to be carried up in an arc after the bullet strikes, and then if we could just measure this angle before it swings back down again, uh, we'll be fine. So M plus M right here. The bullet gets stuck in the wooden block. The whole thing swings up. The kind of little pointer goes out this way. It's attached here, and then when the thing swings back, the pointer tells us what the angle was. Yeah. So let's have a an attempt at ballistic pendulum. I'm going to set this up with a better picture. color for the aftermath. So we're going to have a collision with the bullet here. It's going to collide and then this is going to swing up. And now our block will be here. We'll have M plus M. And the important point is that it's been raised a certain height. So my discussion with the pointer here and the angle that gets fixed in, that would just allow us to figure out the height. Okay. So principally speaking, the block has been raised a certain height. So we'll just label this bullet fired into the block. Okay. So before this is actually, a, this is actually 
a subtle one, so I'm going to set it up carefully. So the bullet's fired into the block. It then starts to move horizontally because it's at the bottom of an arc, and then, of course, it swings up to where I drew it in red. So we have two parts of this situation. We have before and immediately after the collision, or immediately after the collision, we have conservation of momentum. We have momentum conservation, and it's essentially a horizontal problem for this first part here. So momentum is conserved, and we can say mv before the collision, lowercase plus uppercase m d prime after the collision, just the way we solved the initial, the, the problem just a minute ago, okay? So that's a true equation. So now we're talking about after the collision. So we have to break it up into this before and after very carefully. After the collision, we have the energy conservation of a pendulum, okay? Energy conservation. Remember, the first time we ran into the idea of energy conservation, it was with a pendulum. And this thing, after the collision, it's gonna go up and just swing back and forth, okay? So we have energy conservation after the collision. And We actually can quickly we make short sure work of this. We have the kinetic energy of the bullet and block system, and that's right down here, being converted into the potential energy when it's up there. So that's just M plus capital M G H. So yeah, we have two equations and we can use them to solve for what it is we wanted to find out, namely what is the speed of the bullet. Okay. So find the speed of the bullet. Yeah, you have to weigh the bullet. But since V appears in this equation here, we can actually just solve for it. I'll do it in red. So V equals lowercase plus uppercase divided by lowercase m times V prime. But V prime we can get here. In fact, these two cancel. Multiply over by two, we get two GH square root. That's it. We can simplify this a little bit. We can say it is 1 plus capital M divided by little m. Remember, that's the ratio of the block to the bullet mass, m square root of 2GH. Okay, there's the speed of the bullet. And I'm going to assign a couple of problems that are conceptually, you have to set them up like we did with these equations here. They're actually going to be different. One of them is a bullet that's going to be fired into a block and it's going to go flying off the edge of the table. Okay. Um, and the other one's going to be a bullet fired into a block, let's say on the top of something from underneath and it's going to go flying up in the air. But, in fact, that second one where it flies up into the air is literally this setup here. The one where it flies off the table, a little bit different, so you have a good uh, chance to figure it out. Good, so those are good problems here.
so yeah, the ballistic pendulum, we want to be really careful. I think we wrote it out and we got this result. The most important thing always is to be able to set up the two equations. This, these two steps were the actual physics here. Okay, good. Once again, check to see how we're doing time-wise. Okay. Yeah, so once we understand this, we have some interesting, other interesting applications. Another application, this is in the in the book. Maybe I'll possibly assign it, maybe I'll save it for a quiz. But this other example is kind of interesting too. You've got a bullet, you fire it into say a ball that is hanging from a string, and instead of uh, getting stuck in the ball, it goes through. So suppose you had NV right here, and then after the collision, which I'll do in red, the bullet has NV divided by two. That's how the problem in the book goes. Okay. Then how much speed is the ball going to get? Okay. You're still going to have conservation of momentum because the difference between these two momenta here was transferred to the ball, capital M. So what you have is comma, and we have M V prime, I'll call it, this guy is equal to this M V over two, because it was the left over, left over half. That would be momentum conservation. Namely, NV is equal to NV over 2 plus capital NV prime. Right. <coughs> you get that right there. Okay. So I'll send that to you. <coughs> So that was an inelastic collision in which they didn't just stick together, but the same thing holds momentum conservation here, and energy was not conserved in this. Okay. You would treat this now that you knew V prime, you would treat that the same way we did with this thing right here. So this is also, also, go ahead and write that down, we'll put it here, this was inelastic, but not perfectly inelastic. Perfectly inelastic means they really stick together. <clears throat> okay, so we have one more topic I want to get into today. I think we'll stick with that. Yeah. So we're going to go back to the perfectly inelastic collisions in two dimensions. This is an interesting application. So let's call this perfectly, I'll just write inelastic collisions in two dimensions. So now we have our vector equation again. And we have M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals plus M2 V prime. Now the interesting thing about this equation here is it's a vector equation. We have two vectors equaling a third equation, a third vector. So we can actually write this or draw this. We can draw this as a triangle. So I'm going to do an example of an automobile collision. Automobiles 
and we have an intersection and one of our automobiles and the second one, those are one and two, they're racing towards the intersection and they're going to collide right here. Okay. So if they collide and stick together, what happens? Well, you might say, well, if it's equal masses and equal speeds, then by symmetry, I'm expecting a 45 degree angle, okay? If this is a truck, you know, larger vehicle, this is a smaller one, we expect the larger one to push the smaller one out, so we could, maybe it would go that way. But it's really just this vector equation. So if I want to do this here, one and two, I can say that I have a triangle with these three sides. I have M1, V1 here, okay, coming to the right. I have M2, V2, and I have M1 plus M2, V prime. Now, this equation doesn't have to be a right triangle. I took a right triangle scenario with my cars here. Yeah, but if you have this labeled triangle, you can just analyze this triangle. And you'll be able to solve for two unknowns, okay? depending on what's given. So analyze the triangle. That is to say, this equation here is equivalent to this triangle and its analysis. Triangle. Um, and important to note, these are momenta. You can't just say the velocities would satisfy this equation. These are the momenta, and you have any number of relations now. For example, Suppose you come to the scene of the accident and you just measure the skid marks and the angle made because there's a, there's a wreck right over here. Then you could say tangent of theta equals M2V2 divided by M1V1. So depending on what's unknown, you have two equations. And you have possible two equations. This could also be in a football game. This could be a flying tackle. Someone's coming up along the side line up to the end zone. Someone comes in from the side and is going to bump them out, okay, out of play. Then it would be really the same equation here. And it doesn't have to be a right triangle, but I'm just setting it up as a right triangle. We'll find a, we'll find a homework problem that deals with this either this time or next time. So you've got this inelastic collision, and you also have, I'm just going to write etc. You guys know how to analyze a triangle. Okay. You've got your Pythagorean theorem. You've got tangent this way. You can talk about the cosine, the sine. Okay. So just analyze the triangle. Let me just note, we would have the kinetic energy before the collision would be the sum of the two. One half and to V2 squared. It's the sum of the two ki kinetic energies. The kinetic energy after the collision, right? The prime, kinetic energy prime, be the same as we did last time, half sum of the masses V prime squared. And they will not be equal, okay? You can, yeah, in principle they won't be equal, and if you do any example, you'll find they're not equal. Kinetic energy is not equal to kinetic energy prime. That was the first lesson that started the whole collision business off. Okay, in the last few years. okay good. So let's move it there and discuss the homework set. So I wrote a few down here. This is homework number 18. And we're in chapter six. So I wrote down four problems. Let me consult again.
Yeah, these are all good. We will do 32. That is an arrow being shot at a target that's moving towards the arrow. And the target comes to a dead stop after the collision. And the, the arrow goes right through it. So it will, that's purely a momentum. So one equation to set it up right. Target's moving towards the projectile. That's problem 32. I have here problem problem 37. Put a star here. Part of your notes. So the answer to problem 37 is in the notes. Okay. So that one is for free, but it's a good review. Okay, I always like to do that. Then we'll do 41 and 42. These are these ballistic pendulum style problems, although they're not exactly it. Okay, good. There you have it. See you next time.